Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Tell Your Story. I'm your host, Todd Nisloni, and each episode, I look to bring you a different guest who has encouraged, inspired, or challenged me in one way or another, and bring them on to share some of their story in hopes that it inspires you to tell some of yours. I'm so excited today to get to chat with my friend, Andrew Coleman. Andrew, tell everybody kind of who you are. Hey, well, thanks, Todd, for having me on. Um, Andrew Coleman, uh, I am currently the Director of Curriculum Instruction and professional development for uh, here in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Uh, I'm from Louisiana, you know, the home of um, New Orleans, but I'm actually from Northern Louisiana, where um, I spend a lot of time as an elementary teacher, uh, elementary and middle school assistant principal, and I got a chance to be a principal of two awesome um, elementary schools. And so that's kind of who I am. Um, I always categorize myself as a lifelong learner. That's yep. who I am. Well, Andrew, you know, one question that I always love to start with when I have any conversation, regardless of the guest, is back at the beginning. So when you were a kid, what did you dream you were going to be? And how does that even align with what you're doing now? You know, so the thing about it is um, my dreams as a as a kid are um, were like many, you know. So I was that kid who um, one year you want to be a police officer, the next year you want to be a lawyer, the next year you want to be a doctor. And so my path to where I am right now uh kind of happened by happenstance you know i wasn't that person who um always knew that i wanted to be um in education my my zeal and my want to be in education really didn't happen until probably my 11th grade year in high, high school and i had an experience um that uh prompted me to want to be a voice and to be uh, an advocate um, for students and not just for students, but more importantly, for African-American students. But even with that experience, you know, it didn't just immediately make me um, go directly into that. I still went to college and um, majored in history and social sciences. And it wasn't until I decided, hey, let me do what I love, and, you know, and let me work in an area that brings me for fulfillment um, and an area where I feel that I can be um, a significant impact. Right. on the lives of children. So, you know, I kind of just kind of came into this field. Um, I did alternative certification. I didn't go to school to initially be become a teacher, but I had one professor um, who changed my entire um, opinion of what right. teaching could, could look like. So um, what? And that kind of end, ended up there. Well, clearly you're where you're meant to be because you're still in it. So obviously you found something that you loved while you were doing. And so, you know, when you decided to make that jump into education, were you more drawn to elementary or secondary or were you just like, I just want to do education, period. Like, I don't even care. You know, so I've always been, um, I have always been drawn to elementary, you know, so I like to make, um, be a part of the ground making progress. I like to be able to make um, significant change. So I was drawn to elementary. I was drawn to kindergarten and first grade because you're laying the foundation. Yeah. And so um, I have always wanted to do elementary because I like to be the architect, right? Mm -hmm. um, I like to really set the foundation. I like to be the one that's painting the picture and then you can do it after, but I like to be the one that that assess the foundation. So I've always known I wanted to do elementary, but just been a passion of mine. Well, you know, at some point though, you, you realize that you've got a knack for leadership and administration as well. And so was there something that kind of flipped that switch in you that made you think this is this is a this is a good next step for me? You know, when I first started teaching Todd, I got an awesome opportunity to work with some amazing leaders. Um, and I learned a lot from my principals, but I also learned what not to do. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe it was year three. It could have been year five. Um, but I decided that, hey, I want to be able to create professional development opportunities at the campus level that's really going to work for my campus because how do we make change, right? How do we really make significant impact um, in the lives of, of our students? And it comes through ongoing professional development. And I, and I decided then, hey, I need to get my master's degree. I need to be a part of um, the leadership where I can make those changes 
and I can have some um, stake in the decisions that are being made on this campus, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think through those experiences with those leaders, you know, and they did a great job, but I thought, you know what? I can do it a different way yeah. that may work a little bit better for people like me, mm -hmm. you know, what, what about those ones who, who are really wanting that P PD? And so I just decided that, Hey, let's go into leadership. And if the opportunity presents itself, you know, then I'm going to make sure that I'm giving those opportunities to my teachers, to yeah. my instructional coaches so that they're able to grow. I'm all about growing and not yeah. just the leader, but the teachers. And, you know, that's what we do. And that's how we help students. Well, you know, you brought up something really great there. You said, you know, you're all about growing and, you know, growth comes when we're uncomfortable and when we are facing new things. And so, you know, I'd love to know one thing I, I try to ask throughout all these conversations is that whole struggle with comparison and doubt, because I feel like no matter where you are in education or outside of education, any kind of field that you're in, you know, I think we all kind of have those moments where doubt begins to creep in and we feel like we're not the best voice. We're not the best person for the job. We're not this or that, or somebody says something. And so how do you personally keep doubt at bay? So it doesn't take root in your own life. You know, I think that if we're honest with ourselves, we all struggle with doubt, right? Mm -hmm. And we all struggle sometimes with feeling like, maybe we're not enough or we don't know enough or there's someone who can do it better. Mm -hmm. um, and I struggle with that on a daily basis. I'm not going to lie to you. You know, I struggle with um, not always knowing, you know, but I found that the way that I keep that at bay is I try to be very transparent mm -hmm. uh, with the ones that I am working with, you right. know, even though I'm, I may be the principal or whatever role I'm serving in, I think it's important to let your team know that you don't know everything. So mm -hmm. don't expect me to have the answers to everything. But I work with um, this person, um, one of my instructional coaches. She was my very first instructional coach. And um, she would always tell us that the answer is in the is in the room. And mm -hmm. so someone in this room knows knows the answer. And so I keep those things at bay because I try to be honest with myself, Todd. I try to be open with what I can and what I cannot do. Yeah. Um, and I work daily to remind myself that I am enough. I work daily to remind myself that even though I may not know the answer, um, I can surround myself with people who will support me and who will help me. Um, and I think that we're only as good as the circle of people that we surround ourselves with. Yeah. Um, and I'm very big on making sure that um, I'm surrounding myself with people who will support me and who will be honest with me. Um, and I need friends and I need workers and I need colleagues who are willing to say, hey, Andrew, that's not the best yeah. way. But hey, Andrew, let's let's do it this this way. Um, and I think being honest, and I think in education, Todd, you know, a lot of times we we are afraid to be honest with ourselves, you know, and we are afraid as leaders to sometimes say what we can and yeah. what we cannot do. Um, but I challenge myself every day um, to be open and to be honest with what are my limits and what are my strengths and how can I become better. You know, you said something really powerful in there that I think is a great example of your own leadership, and that is making sure that those you surround yourself with will also call you on your crap, will also yeah. tell you when it's like, that's not a good idea, we shouldn't do that, because, you know, sometimes I think especially when a lot of people in leadership positions will get in that uh, mindset of, I need people who will remind me that I'm great and will tell me that all the ideas are good and will jump on board. And it's like, no, you need people who will be real and honest mm -hmm. because that's how real progress is made because none of us have yeah. the right answer all the time. So I love that you said that and I hope people hear that. Well, you know, one of the things too, Andrew, that is, you know, so for those who are listening or watching live or very recently from this being retaped, you're going to be aware of all the things that are happening in our country right now, um, whether that is COVID-19 or the rampant racism, police brutality, and the killing of bl unarmed black men and women. And so my, my first question for you is, you know, how are you? I know that this is, we have a lot going on right now. So how do you 
focus and get anything done when I, I can just, I know the emotional turmoil is there. You know, so that emotion is there uh, and that emotion is, is right on the surface at all, all times. Um, but we have to be honest. And as an African-American man who uh, I'm a father to three African-American boys. So I am raising um, young, young males that will one day be men. But this is the truth of the matter. The way that um, we are being, not being, but the way that you're seeing a lot of African-Americans, um, that feeling, that that anger, that frustration, uh, the truth of the matter is it's always been there. Right. You know, it, and so um, I'm a man of faith. And so I just um, hold, um, I hold tight to my faith and my belief in God and my understanding that, at the end of the day, there are more people um, that are of loving and that are kind and want equality and want equity and want and want justice than the ones that do not. Right. So every day I wake up, I say my prayers to God throughout the day. I pray um, that God will give me strength to be able to interact with people mm -hmm. and not allow what's going on in this world to um to damage or to impact the way that I interact with yeah. someone else. And so um, I'm, I'm dealing, I'm coping. Um, I have hope that, uh, that the future will be better than the present. Mm -hmm. um, and I have hope that we as a nation, we as a people, um, as African Americans, as Caucasian Americans, as Hispanic Americans, um, whatever our nationality is, whatever our ethnicity is, that we're able to come together and see that we have so much more in common right. than we have um, different. Right. And so I treat everybody with that, Todd. You know, no matter what your race or your ethnicity mm -hmm. is, I treat you for who you are. Right. Um, and we have to remember that everybody's not bad, you know, but yeah. there's more good than there is bad. You know, and I think that's such a great perspective because, you know, just because one person who looks a certain way does something doesn't mean everybody who who looks or or has that same that religion or whatever is like them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one question I'd love to kind of dive into a little bit is, you know, you're raising three boys and mm -hmm. and and what kind of conversations are you having with them and, and how are they interpreting what's going on? Because like you said, none of this is new for you, yeah. but it's, there's a, a brighter spotlight on it right now than there ever has been. And so how, how does that affect what your boys are going through and the conversations you're having with them? You know, so the conversation that I have with my, with my sons as African-American men, um, it's different than the conversations that you would have with your, your right. son. Right. Um, I've always had conversations since my kids were young about um, who they are, mm -hmm. um, their heritage, their ethnicity, um, and what this world thinks of them and right. who they are because what they think of their, of themselves. And I've always um, prided myself and I've always taught my boys that that you are um, not what someone thinks of you, but you are who you know that you are. Mm -hmm. So we're having conversations yeah. about police brut brutality. Uh, we've had conversations about when you're driving. You know, I have my, my oldest son just graduated from from high school and he's going off to college in the in the fall. And we've had conversations about, you know, when you go off to college, there are going to be certain things that you can't do because of the color of, of your skin, right. you know, and we've had conversations about how to interact with the po police. Mm -hmm. It's sad, but we have. Mm -hmm. um, we've had conversations about um, when you walk into certain rooms and when you're a part of certain crowds, um, people are going to feel a certain way about you. But at the end of every conversation, I always remind my boys that we cannot control how people see us. Mm -hmm. We cannot control the opinions of others. But what we can control is our interactions with each other and how we interact with um, other people. But we have to be cautious. And the sad thing is that um, we're from an area that um, has a larger population of Caucasians um, mm -hmm. and African-Americans. 
and I've always lived in an area where there are more, um, I've always been the true my, minority. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't make us feel uncomfortable, right. but we are aware right. of um, the things that, that are going on. And so my, my kids understand, hey, I'm an African-American male. You know, right now there's things going on in the world. There's, there's hateful rhetoric, there's hateful speech being spewed, but that's not who I am. Right. Um, and I am who I am and I'm going to be the best that I'm, I'm going to be. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to get my education. Mm -hmm. You can't take that from me. And not only am I going to get my education, but I'm going to be the best that I can be. I'm going to be best me. Right. And so I, we, we talk about comparing ourselves. We, we can't compare ourselves to anyone else, but, but we have to be the best version of ourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and make sure that the race that we are running um, is a race that we're not in competition, but right. we're all in competition with our with ourselves. So we taught we have some tough conversations. Yeah. We have some heavy conversations um, about who we are. But I just believe that um, the heart of the human race, uh, we are so much greater um, than what's going on than what's going on now. You know, as I've talked over the last couple of weeks with countless different friends of mine who are who are different people of color, the the conversation that I keep hearing come up again and again are the two things that the two conversations they have with their kids. Mm -hmm. One of them being understanding, you know, that because we look this way, we have to act this way in certain rooms or with police yeah. officers or in these instances. But the other really powerful conversation that I have heard come up again and again and again is another one that you just repeated when you said you tell your boys that you own who you are. You are beautiful. You are wonderfully made. You love this skin. You love who we are. You love our background and our culture. And to me, that's a really powerful thing to hear that, you know, regardless of what this world is going to say about you or regardless of what uneducated and ignorant people will, will think about you, you are amazing. And I just love hearing so many black families just pouring into their kids like that. And I think that's something those of us who are white or from any other nationality can really hear and take back too. And that's not saying, I, I want people to hear me correctly here. I'm not saying white people don't pour into their kids or, or my Latinx friends don't pour into their kids. I'm not saying that at all. But I think that's something that I've heard as a continual thread through these conversations is that my 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 African American friends have been very intentional about having that conversation because they know their kids will be told otherwise at some yeah. point. And so I, I just it's it's powerful for me as a as a fellow educator to hear you share that. Um, and, and, and you know, Todd, at the beginning of this, we kind of talked a little bit about doubt. And you know, and you know, you and I both know that the words that are spoken to you, whether they are in person, on social media, the things that people say to us, you know, it impacts us. No matter how much we try to say that it doesn't, it impacts us. Whether we get um, a negative tweet or a negative comment on Facebook, on Instagram, those things, um, it becomes a part of you. And if you do not cut it off, it can shape who you are. And so I cannot change the fact that my children one day will possibly be called racial slurs. Mm -hmm. I can't change one day that they will possibly one day feel black. Mm -hmm. They will feel different. I mm -hmm. can't change that. But what I can change is to continue to pour into them that you are special. You are unique. You are your own person. And the sky is really the limit for what you can do. I can control that. Yeah. And even with everything that's going on in the world, I can't control the media. I can't control you no know, um, ignorant people, but I can control how I feel yeah. each and every day. And that's based on me continuing to encourage myself and encourage others. Um, and I make it a point to encourage other um, African-Americans, not only African-Americans, but other individuals white, Latino, whatever your ethnicity is, to encourage them also, because 
this is hard on me, uh, but it but it's even hard on someone looking in and seeing um, their friends, their colleagues be mistreated um, for things that they can't can't control. Yeah. So I think that we just have to remind each other that we are in this together, and mm -hmm. together means that we support each other. Yeah. You know, that's just that's just the way that we have we have to be. You know, and you said something really beautiful there is that, you know, no matter who you are, where you come from, what your background is, we are in this thing together. Yeah. And the sooner that more people can realize that they are not better than anyone else, and that if we just step up and just truly love each other and pour into each other, that's how we can make this better when we seek to yeah. understand instead of seek to compare. Um, well, you know, Andrew, one way that I always love to end all these conversations on is I believe there are things we hold really close to our hearts and are who we are and the foundation of why we do what we do. And so for anybody who's listening or watching today, if they were to walk away with one thing, what would your one thing be for them? Oh, Todd, that's a deep question, man. <laughs> Probably, you know, one of the the things that I always live by and um, is every day you should strive to be better. And, you know, I I think that if we strive each day to be a better a better version of ourself, then we will get to where we need it to be. Mm -hmm. um, I always live by this, that we are a work in progress and we will never, ever be complete. But each day, I hope that Andrew Coleman today is better than Andrew Coleman from yesterday. And I hope that I learned something today from someone or from some interaction that makes me better tomorrow, whether that's my um, the way I interact, whether it's writing curriculum, whether it's teaching. But I hope that my story evolves over time. And so when you think about who you are, if you're not getting better then what's really happening, you, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I hope that someone leaves from this Tell Your Story episode and we understand that one, we can always be better. Yeah. And two, um, we should always be striving to be a little bit better each and every day than what we are today. My story gets better with time and it, and, and it doesn't go, go back. I love that. And that is the perfect way to end this conversation, Andrew. Well, I've been looking forward to this chat. And so thank you so much for making some time to talk with me today. Hey, thanks, Todd. You, you have a wonderful day. And thank you, everybody, for listening or watching another episode of Tell Your Story. Remember, you can check out past episodes on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, wherever you get your stuff. It's there. I hope today's conversation with Andrew has encouraged you to get out there and tell your story because every story matters.